protecting from crystalline silica. What is crystalline silica? Crystalline silica is a basic component of soil, sand, granite, and many other minerals. Quartz is the most common form of crystalline silica. Cristobalite and tritomite are two other forms of crystalline silica. All three forms may become small enough sized particles when workers chip, cut, drill, or grind objects that contain crystalline silica that could enter your breathing and possibly cause health hazards. What are the hazards of crystalline silica? Silica exposure remains a serious threat to nearly 2 million U.S. workers, including more than 100,000 workers in high-risk jobs such as abrasive blasting, foundry work, stone cutting, rock drilling, quarry work, and tunneling. The seriousness of the health hazards associated with silica exposure is demonstrated by the fatalities and disabling illnesses that continue to occur in sandblasters and people who work in rock quarries and similar jobs. Crystalline silica has been classified as a human lung carcinogen. Additionally, breathing crystalline silica can cause silicosis, which in severe cases can be disabling or even fatal. The respiral silica dust enters the lungs and causes the formation of scar tissue, thus reducing the lungs' ability to take in oxygen. There is no cure for silicosis. Since silicosis affects lung function, it makes one more susceptible to lung infections like tuberculosis. In addition, smoking causes lung damage and adds to the damage caused by breathing silica dust. Let's take a look at silicosis. Doctor, I've been hearing in our training classes about silicosis, but uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Well, silicosis is a disease of the lungs caused by the continued breathing in of air containing silica. Silica is a hard, abrasive mineral. It comes in three forms, quartz, which is the most common, and cristobalite and tritomite, which are not as common, but are more toxic. Silica is found in all types of rock and in most metal and non-metal ores. Because soil is formed from the weathering of rock, most of the dirt covering the earth contains some silica. Now, the form of silica and the amount of silica in the work site or ore can vary. You should talk to your safety director or foreman. They can describe what's in your area because of your company's sampling program. It's important to know when silica is present in the materials you're working with, what silicosis is, and how to avoid getting it. I don't know much about the lungs, doctor, except I know you need them to breathe. Uh, could you explain how they work and uh, how the uh, lungs are affected by dust? It'll be easier with an illustration. Uh, if you've got a few minutes, come with me to the training room. Well, you've really got a nice training room here, John, with some really good materials. In fact, uh, here's a drawing that can show you what I'm talking about. This is a human respiratory system, your breathing system, that circulates oxygen throughout your body to allow it to work. As you inhale, the air travels down a tube called the trachea, or windpipe, into the bronchial tubes, and into smaller ducts called bronchioles. It eventually reaches the end air spaces, tiny sacs, which are functional parts of the lungs called alveoli. This is where the oxygen gets into our blood, and carbon dioxide, a waste product, is returned to our lungs to be exhaled. This is the most important function of our lungs, to get oxygen into our body and to get carbon dioxide out. Well, the human lung is quite a unique organ. Keep in mind, though, that anything that can significantly affect the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide can cause health problems for a person. I remember hearing in our training classes that the respiratory system cleans itself. How does it do that? That's a good question. It all begins in the nose, where we have nose hair, followed by cells and mucus lining the walls of the nasal passages. The nose hair filters out the largest particles, which are then removed when we blow our nose. As you get farther down in the respiratory system, another mechanism comes into play. It's called the mucociliary escalator. It works like a conveyor. The hair cells of the mucociliary escalator, which line the upper airways, along with the mucus, catch and trap large particles and then sweep them up and out, where you swallow them or spit them out. This is the lung's first defense against bacteria or dust. What if the silica particles get by this first defense? If the silica particles are very small, what we call respirable dust, 
they can penetrate deep in the lung. But also deep inside the lung, within the alveoli, we find the next defense mechanism. These are called macrophage cells. They operate just like the video game Pac-Man, gobbling up particles and getting rid of them on the mucociliary escalator, or through the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is like a, a storm drainage system that works to get rid of unwanted fluids and materials. However, if there are too many particles, these macrophages become overloaded and can't remove the particles from the lung. Well, what happens then? If too much silica dust is inhaled over a long period of time, it overwhelms the lung's defense mechanisms. This starts an inflammatory process in the lungs. As the dust begins to collect, the overloaded macrophage cell walls rupture and release fluids which result in inflammation. This triggers other specialized lung cells to come to the area of inflammation. These special cells, called fibroblasts, attempt to wall off or surround the silica particles in an effort to protect the lung. This is done by forming scar tissue to isolate the silica particles. This scarring is similar to the process that happens after you cut your finger and a scar forms as the cut heals. When this scarring action occurs in the lung, it continues to progress and it can reduce the lung's ability to expand and contract and can impair its ability to take oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. If too much healthy lung tissue is replaced by scar tissue, you develop complicated silicosis, which may be a disabling disease that can eventually cause death. Does the amount of dust I'm working in affect whether I get the disease or, or how bad it is? Oh, definitely. There are basically three types of this disease, acute, accelerated, and chronic. They're characterized by the speed in which the lungs get overloaded and scarred. Now, this speed is determined by the amount and duration of exposure. Acute silicosis can develop within a very short time within a few weeks to four to five years of exposure to exceptionally high concentrations of respirable silica dust. And it usually results in death, since the lungs are so rapidly overloaded. The deaths of many people working on the Hawks Nest Tunnel in West Virginia some years ago is an example of how severe and rapid this form of silicosis can be. Sweeping the country. Silicosis was taking its toll from the ranks of American workers. Congress has just started to investigate the building of Hawk's Nest Tunnel, known as the Village of Death. Accelerated silicosis can result from working in areas of high concentrations of respirable silica dust for a period of five to ten years. It is disabling and often results in death. Accelerated silicosis can progress more rapidly than chronic silicosis, even if the worker is removed from exposure. The third type, chronic silicosis, is the most common form and can result from exposure to respirable silica dust at relatively low concentrations. It may take 10 years or more of exposure before it is detected. It progresses much more slowly, but it can also cause impairment and death. What are the symptoms of silicosis anyway? Do they differ among the types of silicosis? Common symptoms are shortness of breath, fatigue, and difficulty in performing tasks, like walking upstairs. The severity of the symptoms and how soon they occur would differ among the three forms of silicosis. For example, these symptoms would occur rapidly and be very severe for acute silicosis, but the disease may show up on an x-ray. Why an x-ray? Chest x-rays are the best way to detect most cases of silicosis in their early stages. The purpose of an x-ray is early detection of scarring in your lungs. With chronic silicosis, we can often detect evidence of dust exposure in your lungs many years before you would notice any symptoms, such as getting out of breath or tiring easily. If detected early, the company can take action to protect you against further exposure, reducing the possibility that the disease will progress. It is important to get x-rays but it is just as important to have them read by a physician skilled in the recognition of dust diseases, such as a physician with a B reader certification issued by NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Well, how often should I have an X-ray? X-rays are taken some years apart because chronic silicosis, the most common form of silicosis, normally takes years to develop. 
You should have one soon after the start of your employment and then periodically thereafter. NIOSH recommends that ground silica workers have an x-ray every year and for other workers with exposure to respirable silica at least every three years. Isn't there some kind of blood test for silicosis like there is for other diseases? Now, maybe someday, but right now the recommended method of detection is a chest x-ray. This is also part of normal medical screening and surveillance procedures for other dust diseases. Is there any cure for silicosis? There is no cure. The scarring of silicosis is irreversible. That's why early detection is so important. What about cancer? Now, I've heard that silica causes cancer, and bags of our industrial sand do carry cancer warnings. There are ongoing scientific studies on how breathing silica dust increases risk of developing lung cancer in humans. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, known as IARC, classified crystalline silica in the form of quartz and cristobalite as carcinogenic in humans, what is called a group one classification. This determination was based on both human and animal studies. The evidence suggests that the lung tumors in rats result from persistent inflammation and scarring. A first step in preventing lung cancer is to prevent silicosis so the lungs aren't overloaded and scarred by silica. Uh, some of my friends smoke, and does that determine whether or not you get silicosis? No, it doesn't. Although smoking is the leading cause of lung cancer, and it can increase the frequency and severity of other lung diseases, it doesn't appear to increase the risk of developing silicosis or its progression. As you know, I'm always encouraging my patients to quit smoking to improve their overall health. But let's stay on silicosis for now. What are some of the things that can be done to help prevent silicosis? There are many things that can be done. You can help management maintain the dust collection and ventilation systems your company has installed. Make sure you report problems with these systems when they occur. Good housekeeping and proper cleanup of dust are important. Never dry sweep. Use a vacuum system or water cleanup method. Work with your supervisor to help reduce dust exposures by reporting leaks, malfunctions, and spills. Follow good work practices and don't create more dust by leaving inspection ports or doors open. Avoid areas you know or believe to be dusty and report them to your supervisor so the company can correct the situation. Remember, respirable dust is too small to see, so you can't spot all the hazardous areas. But a visibly dusty area is one that needs checked out. What about respirators? Uh, how important are they? I, mean, I really don't like wearing them. Sometimes they're uncomfortable. I know respirators can be uncomfortable, but they are extremely important. They work just like the air filter in your car, only more efficiently. When used as a part of a good respirator program, they can be an effective barrier to prevent you from inhaling dust into your lungs while permanent engineering controls are being installed. Although most people are always sensitive to anything on or around their face, respirators can be reasonably comfortable. To be effective, a respirator must make a good tight seal with your face. That usually means no beards or mustaches. You should have a fit test annually, but if the respirator becomes uncomfortable, talk to your foreman or safety director. Sometimes people gain or lose weight or have new dentures, and the respirator they have no longer fits or feels comfortable. Often a change in size or model is all that is needed. In order for a respirator to work, it must seal tightly to the face. So remember, no beards or no mustaches that interfere with the seal of your respirator. Well, it sounds like the prevention of silicosis is a a combination of all the things we've discussed. You've got that right. All parts of a silicosis prevention program have to be followed. And especially remember to take advantage of your company's medical surveillance program. Get your routine physical exams, x-rays, and pulmonary function tests. They detect disease before there's significant damage. One of the most important points to keep in mind, John, is silicosis is a preventable disease. We can all work together to reduce exposure to silica. Well, I've learned a lot from our discussion, Doctor. I'm beginning to realize that I play an important role in preventing silicosis. Good. Now if we can get everybody to understand, we can eliminate silicosis from the workplace. 
Uh, speaking of workplace, my shift's about ready to start. I better get ready to work. Doctor, thanks for talking to me. Thank you, John. Have a good day. What are the symptoms of silicosis? Silicosis is classified into three types, chronic, classic, accelerated, and acute. Chronic classic silicosis, the most common, occurs after 15 to 20 years of moderate to low exposures to respirable crystalline silica. Symptoms associated with chronic silicosis may or may not be obvious. Therefore, workers need to have a chest x-ray to determine if there is lung damage. As the disease progresses, the workers may experience shortness of breath upon exercising and have clinical signs of poor oxygen-carbon dioxide exchange. In the later stages, the worker may experience fatigue, extreme shortness of breath, chest pain, or respiratory failure. Accelerated silicosis can occur after 5 to 10 years of high exposures to respirable crystalline silica. Symptoms include severe shortness of breath, weakness, and weight loss. The onset of symptoms takes longer than in acute silicosis. Acute silicosis occurs after a few months or as long as two years following exposures to extremely high concentrations of respirable crystalline silica. Symptoms of acute silicosis include severe disabling shortness of breath, weakness, and weight loss, which often leads to death. Where are construction workers exposed to crystalline silica? Exposure occurs during many different construction activities. The most severe exposures generally occur during abrasive blasting with sand to remove paint and rust from bridges, tanks, concrete structures, and other surfaces. Other construction activities that may result in severe exposure include jackhammering, rock well drilling, concrete mixing, concrete drilling, brick and concrete block cutting and sawing, tuck pointing, tunneling operations. Where are general industry employees exposed to crystalline silica dust? The most severe exposures to crystalline silica result from abrasive blasting, which is done to clean and smooth irregularities from molds, jewelry, and foundry castings, finish tombstones, etch or frost glass, or remove paint, oils, rust, or dirt from objects needing to be repainted or treated. Other exposures to silica dust occur in cement and brick manufacturing, asphalt pavement manufacturing, china and ceramic manufacturing, and the tool and dye, steel and foundry industries. Crystalline silica is used in manufacturing, household abrasives, adhesives, paints, soaps, and glass. Additionally, crystalline silica exposures occur in the maintenance, repair, and replacement of refractory brick furnace linings. In the maritime industry, shipyard employees are exposed to silica primarily in abrasive blasting operations to remove paint and clean and prepare steel hulls, bulkheads, decks, and tanks for paints and coatings. How is OSHA addressing exposure to crystalline silica? OSHA has an established permissible exposure limit, or PEL, which is the maximum amount of crystalline silica to which workers may be exposed during an eight-hour work shift. 29 CFR 1926.55.1910.1000 OSHA also requires hazard communications training for workers exposed to crystalline silica and requires a respirator protection program until engineering controls are implemented. Additionally, OSHA has a National Emphasis Program, NEP, for crystalline silica exposure to identify, reduce, and eliminate health hazards associated with occupational exposures. You can obtain more information on silica from OSHA, as they have various publications, standards, technical assistance, and compliance tools to help you, and offers extensive assistance through workplace consultation, voluntary protection programs, strategic partnerships, alliances, state plans, grants, training, and education.